John the Baptist has been preaching and baptizing uh, in Israel, uh, baptizing in the Jordan and preaching around that area for a pretty good while and has now been in, involved in baptizing Jesus and declaring him uh, to be the Messiah, Savior of the world. Okay? John had, for sure, four disciples, a set of brothers, and we, when we're, our passage begins today, we're going to see, if you read just up above that, one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He found first his own brother, Simon, and said, we found the Messiah. He brought him. And so uh, we've got probably two sets of brothers. We're going to wind up with six. And they were, they were followers of the teaching of John the Baptist. And so we pick this up with uh, Philip. And notice that Jesus has gone from the Jordan area of Bethany. He has now left, quote, town, has gone back to Galilee. The next day, he proposed to go forth into Galilee. And he found Philip. And he said to Philip, follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida of the city of Andrew and Peter. That's in Galilee. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. That's covering pretty much all the Messianic teachings of the Old Testament. John really poured it on apparently. We have found him because they're getting this out of John. John is pushing them back into the scriptures of Messianic passages, both out of the law and the writings, uh, the prophetic teachings. And listen to what they've identified, because, because of John's teaching, they have identified that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Notice how this is said here. <laughs> we have found, uh, Philip says to Nathaniel, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote. Listen, to he says, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. I mean, he identifies the, the, the humanity of the Messiah. He, he, he identifies the person. Now, in the Old Testament, he's called the anointed, Jesus, uh, Christ is called the anointed one or Messiah. But they picked up from John, when John baptized Jesus, they picked up from John that Jesus of Nazareth, now they're pretty excited, you know why? Because they're all from Galilee. Jesus, listen how they identified him, you're missing it. Look how they identified Jesus. Jesus of what? Nazareth. See, that's a hometown. They played each other in football. This is a rivalry type of thing. So this is really important. I mean, he says, look, at, I mean, he's excited about this. You're not going to, listen, we've discovered from John, John's been teaching on the Messiah. Oh, yeah, I know John said John's a prophet, and he's been teaching on the Messiah. But listen, the other day, he identified that Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. He's the Christ. Did you get it? Not only that, but he's the son of Joe. Do you know the carpenter, the guy who goes and says, every time you have something wrong in the house, he comes in and fixes it. The handy guy. See, this is all stuff they know. This is local newspaper stuff. And they're, listen, he's pretty excited about this. Well, until, until Nathaniel speaks. Nathaniel said to him, can, he good thing, can any good thing come out of Nazareth or Galilee? I mean, the Messiah, Messiah can't come out of Galilee. The Messiah can't come out of Nazareth. That's not scriptural. I love his answer. This is what happens when somebody's got you scripturally. 
then you go to the man that you think could help you. So here's what he says. He, he says the same thing. Listen, he says, look, he don't fuss with him. He goes, like, I don't know. But let me take you to somebody who I think can explain it. Let's go to the man himself. Let's go to the man himself. And you ask him. Let's go to the man himself. John said that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ. And he backed it up with a whole bunch of scripture. Now, I, I yeah. This is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel says, I don't think so. I don't jive with scriptures. He doesn't fuss with him. He said, well, let's go talk to the man himself. I think I can get you an interview. I'm following him. I'm one of his followers. I can get you into the man. You do understand that, don't you? I get you to the man. Let the man tell you. I don't know. I mean, you got me. I don't know. I know this. John believes that he's the Messiah. I know he's from Nazareth. I don't know about the rest of this stuff. So let's go ask the man. <laughs> I really like that. So let's go talk to the man. Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and he said to him, Behold an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile or deceit. You know, you know what he's actually saying? He's, listen, this is important because it's important that you study. Actually, what he's saying is, Behold Jacob without deceit. I'll show that to you later. An Israelite, in, indeed, in whom there is no guilt. Guile. Nathaniel said to him, here's a guy with... Po Let me tell you, this is how easy it is when you meet somebody that's positive with the Word of God, looking for somebody to just explain it. I was at one of those guys. Everybody was telling me, why I should be saved, nobody was telling me how. And when somebody explained to me how, then I, I, I moved into a whole different ball game. And so this is Nathaniel. Nathaniel said to them, how did you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And he uses the word horeo all the way through this passage on saw and see. This is not a blippo. I wasn't passing by and looked over there, and there you were sitting under a tree. He used horeo, which means I saw you in my mind. That sounds like a pickup line, doesn't it, girls? You're the girl of my dreams. Well, anyhow, don't dwell on that too much with you. Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you, Horeo. I saw you in my mind. Nathaniel said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Now, how quick was that deal? <laughs> I mean, he went from speaking with Philip, I don't think so. Nothing good. There's nothing. The, the Messiah couldn't come out of Galilee. Nothing's going to come out of Galilee and Samaria and all that. Philip says, well, I don't know. Look, I know I'm following him. Let me take you to the man. The man will explain it. And the man did. man said to him, the, I mean, I, how do you lead a person to Christ with this idea? I saw you in my mind's eye. I saw you under the fig tree, which where he was, and Jesus wasn't nowhere near him. And he jumped. You see, a natural thing might be to jump that he's a prophet. But he wasn't because Philip has already declared him through John the Baptist that he's the Christ, the Messiah. 
and he identifies with that when he says, you are the son of God and the king of Israel. That's how quick he went. I mean, he's just looking for somebody to explain it. Agreed? He's got positive volition. He's looking, would somebody tell me how? <clears throat> there are a lot of people like Nathaniel and Ron Adama. Just explain to me how. Stop giving me fluff. Tell me how. Jesus said to him, watch this. Here's verse 50 that sets up 51, truly, truly. Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You shall see greater things than these. Now listen, here's what's important. That's a second person singular. He is speaking directly to Nathaniel. By the word Nathaniel, see the E-L on the end of his name? That's the word God in Hebrew. Nathaniel, Nathan, N-A-T-H-A-N, is the word give. God has given is his name. God has given. Behold, I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You shall see greater things than these. Now watch. Jesus said to him, truly, truly, I say to you. But the word you this time is second person plural. He's speaking to all who are present. And he's using Nathaniel as a visual aid. Truly, truly, I say to you, remember that's that amen, amen. We just say in our doxology, you know how we closed our doxology the way they did in the Old Testament. All doxology and the New Testament doxologies were always closed with amen, right? We closed our doxology with amen. A doxology is always closed with amen, which means so let it be. Because amen means what has just been previously stated is based on the veracity of God and therefore is true. But you see, Jesus didn't use it at the end. He used it at the beginning and he doubled it. This word truly, truly is the Hebrew word amen. It has a divine side and a human side, which we've explained to you. The divine side is the doctrinal principle he wants you to get. You need to get it and then sign off back to him, so let it be. When you say amen, you're saying amen to what has been previously stated. In our doxology, when you say amen, listen, if you don't believe it, don't say amen. Because you're signing off on it. I don't know what you think amen means, but I've just told you. It's the real deal. Truly, truly, I say to you, you shall see, listen to this, you shall see the heavens open. That's a perfect tense. Open in the past, the results it remains open forever for you. Positive volition, listen, and the whole secret here is positive volition. Positive volition towards Jesus Christ will open the floodgates of heaven. And out of that will flow the truth of the essence of God through your life. That's just what he said. It's exactly what he just said. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, you shall see, Horeo, the heavens opened and the angel, angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. You know where he got that from? Jacob's ladder. That's Jacob's ladder. That's Genesis 28. And you know what Jacob's ladder was? It was a ladder between God and man. And you know that mediate and that ladder was a mediator. And you know who that mediator was? Jesus says it was me. I was the ladder. I, because I am the mediator between God and man. And Nathaniel, you have just 
sign the greatest deal in your life. You have come to me and declared me to be the mediator between God and man, and you couldn't be more right, my buddy. You are on the money. You shall see the heavens open, and you will see the angels of God in descending and descending upon the Son of Man. And in his lifetime, he will see it. And what he will see in that is the divine essence of God flowing from God through Christ through his life. I'm going to show you that today after a word of prayer. I give you that moment of silence as a believer priest. Al certainly established it, but you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit as a believer in the church age. Every believer is indwelt. The indwelling is where spirituality, spirituality is where Bible study should be. The power of the Holy Spirit to teach you the truth, the truth that will set you free from the cosmic world system that the devil rules. And 1 John 1, 9 is identity with that spirituality. Carnality can't study the Bible. Identity of carnality is personal sin. Personal sin is confessed. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. That allows us to study the Bible under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and he will teach you truth truth, and you need to see this today. Listen, you need to understand before we enter this prayer that the essence of God, the sovereignty, the righteousness, the love, the eternal life, all of these things, the eternal life flowing in the abundance of its manifestation in our life, the essence of God flowing to our life. I will show you greater things than these. Boy, Nathan, if you think this is good, hang on, brother, because I'm going to show you the essence of God flowing from God through Jesus Christ into your life in dynamics. Father, we pray that today in all of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, If you paid attention when we read 43 through 51, you realize there's three conversations going on in that text. There's a conversation between uh, Philip and Nathaniel about who, who the Messiah is. In verse 47 and 48, correct that on your paper, in verse 47 and 48, and, uh, uh, Philip brings... Nathaniel to Jesus, and Jesus engaged in a conversation, and Nathaniel responds, you're the, you're the uh, millennial king. You're the, you're the millennial king. Okay? Now, I want you to write this. Uh, I want you to write a little note next to this, uh, Jesus' conversation with Nathaniel. I want you to write down the passage, because Nathaniel was concerned about whether Jesus was from Nazareth, or agreed? I mean, uh, Nazareth or Galilee. I want you to write down John 7, 40 through 52. And I want you to pay attention to a specific name in there who argues on behalf of Jesus Christ on this same issue before the Sanhedrin. It is a man called Nicodemus. Pay special attention to a guy who is on the Supreme Court who is arguing on behalf of Jesus of whether or not Jesus of Gal is from Galilee. We know that's where his residence address was. In other words, if you want to mail him a letter, that's where you mailed it. But that's not where he was born. And where you're born is very important. He wasn't born in Nazareth. He lived in Nazareth. He was born in Bethlehem. Let me tell you, you, you don't realize how big this is. This was a big argument in Israel in the first century about Jesus Christ because nothing good can come out of Galilee, right? And they argued that Jesus was from Nazareth, from Galilee, therefore he couldn't be the Messiah. Now listen to me. This is important. 
Because Matthew, when he writes, he writes it, he writes and documents Matthew 1 and 2. He writes and documents that Jesus is from uh, Bethlehem and fulfilled Micah 5 2. And also makes a big deal of the Magi coming in, identifying it. Agreed? They come in, right? They come in. A year later, they, they go to... And listen, this was, this was well-known stuff because of Herod killing all the kids. Come on now, a year later. They were still, they were still in Bethlehem, the birthplace. All right? They, he was born, they went to Egypt, come back. There we have it. So, Matthew takes great pains in bringing that argument out and documenting it. Sometimes we, we, we miss this by, you know, by not knowing, by not putting some of these pieces together. Uh, today's phrase of truly, truly in verse 51 comes off a declaration that Nathaniel makes to Jesus when he says, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. And off from that in 49, Jesus comes back and makes a statement to him in 50 and makes a statement to the rest of the disciples in 51. I want, <coughs> I want to talk about five things about verse 51 when he says, greater things than these that you will see, and you will see heavens open, and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. That's The Son of Man is the term that's most identifiable with the Messiah of the Old Testament. It is part of that hypostatic union. When you put Son of Man and Son of God together in the person of Jesus Christ, you have what we call hypostatic union, undiminished deity and true humanity in one person forever. Now here's the first point. What Jesus does in, Matt, in uh, verse 50 and 51, he attaches two promises to the Messianic declaration to Nathaniel that is offered to the other apostles that believe the same thing. Jesus says to Nathaniel, because I said to this, because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? Now the word is horeo. He said, you shall see. Now, you remember Jesus said, I saw you under the fig tree, horeo. I didn't see you sitting there. I saw you in their language as a vision. I saw you in my mind. I, I already had you in my mind. So when he says to Nathaniel, you shall see, horeo, he puts it in a future, that's F, future, middle, indicative, second person singular. He says, you personally shall see greater things than these. Then in verse 51, he turns to the disciples in the plurality of horeo, and he says, truly, truly, I say to you, you all, we would say in the south, you all will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So he makes two promises, one to Nathaniel and the other in similarity uh, to the apostles, uh, to the other. There are six, by now we have six disciples. I want you to keep that in mind because this is going to be important as we carry our lesson on. The second thing I want you to see is that Jesus gave Nathaniel a great compliment earlier that's important to the truly, truly phrase. He said to Nathaniel, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. If you've been studying with us, along with us in our study on Tuesday night in the book of Genesis, then you are very much aware that in Egypt, Jacob is referred to as Israel. That's a common name. Only the insiders are going to refer to him as Jacob. Only insiders. People in the family are going to call him Jacob. But he's going to be known in Israel as Israel. 
Jacob is going to be known as Israel. And I can't tell you how important that is prophetically because the family of Jacob that went into Egypt is going to be Israel coming out. They're going to be a nation. And so this name, the way it's used in the book of Genesis is really important. In Egypt, Jacob is called Israel, and Jacob is also known by the phrase cunning, cunning deceit, right? If you know, and, and listen, he got that name out of um, the birthright deal with Esau. You remember that? You know, buying a whole thing and disguising himself in, in deceit. Well, that's how he got that. Uh, you can read about this in Genesis 27, verses 35 and 36, over that deceit business. Uh, he, so he, he, he got that reputation. Jesus gave Nathaniel this compliment as an Israelite believer. He, he compliments him. He compliments him because, listen, most of Israel is, is into the cunning deceit to such a degree that they're going to hang their Messiah on a cross. And to find an Israelite in the Word of God in whom there is no guile, deceit, cunning deceit that comes from Satan's way of thinking is a breath of fresh air. And he compliments him on it. He said, and what he's complimenting is positive volition. He's complimenting his positive volition, and he's doing it in a very common way to an Israelite. I mean, he, he, I, I suppose in our society, he gave him a, a big five, you know, <laughs> popped his hand up there, give me a five. I mean, it's that this is important, this idea of what Jesus said to him is important to the truly, truly statement that Jesus is going to give Nathaniel and to the rest of the... Because I can proceed. You're, you're, you're not caught up with cosmos thinking like the, like the average Jew out there today. They're wishy-washy. I see within you uh, positive listening character. It's a good thing to question what you don't understand so that you can believe what you do. Here's the third thing. This is important for you to understand here today. Jesus always sees more in us than we see in ourselves and more than others see in us. You need to really get that under your belt. Because so much of your life about how you feel about yourself is how other people view you. And you're always going to be up and down emotionally because of it. That's not what God wants from your life, ha having been born again. You're a new creature. 2 Corinthians 5.17 You are a new creature in Christ. All things have been passed away, and behold, all things are new. And if you depend on how other, if you depend on how you view yourself the way other people view you, you will always be in that depressive place periodically. And so it's important for you to understand along with Nathaniel that Jesus saw in him something that Philip didn't see. He saw more. Philip saw positive volition. Jesus saw more. He saw in him an Israelite who has no guile. He saw in him a person that was capable of seeing through Jesus Christ the essence of God flow to his life. Greater things than these. What, what, listen to me. What was it that he saw that Jesus says you will see greater things? What was it he saw? 
Listen to me now. I don't know what point this is. Somewhere down there is going to be this point. He saw the omniscience. He saw the omniscience of God in that statement Jesus made. He declared him to be the Son of God, the King of Israel. What did he see? He said, you will see greater things than this. What was it he saw? Well, we know what he saw because he said it. When Jesus said, I did that, and he said, wow. And Jesus said, do you believe that I saw that? Do you believe I saw that? Well, of course he does. And what did he see? He saw the omniscience of God. He didn't call, listen. Listen to me now. Did Nathaniel call him the son of man? Or did he call him the son of God? He called him the son of God, didn't he? He called him a chip off the old block. He called him a son of God. Do you know what had just flowed from Jacob's ladder? Do you know what had just flowed from God through Christ, the mediator? Was the omniscience of God that he actually participated in. Oh, please see, say, say you see that. And greater things than these is now you're going to see the omniscience, you're going to see the sovereignty, you're going to see the righteousness, you're going to see the love, you're going to see eternal life, you're going to see holiness, you're going to see omniscience again, you're going to see omnipresent, you're going to see veracity, immutability, yada, yada. And it's, you're not, it's not going to be from the Bible, you're going to be able to see it flow flow from the throne of God through Jesus Christ into your life and manifested. Do you sing God that way? Do you sing God that way? The essence of God is not something out here. The essence of God is something in here. Eternal life is not out there. Eternal life is in here. The love of God is not out there. The love of God is in here. Romans 5.5, 5, the love of God has been shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. Boom, it's salvation. The problem is, you still think of yourself somewhere out there rather than him somewhere in here. You're out here and Christ is in here. Pay attention to who's in you, not who you're into. You need to be into the one who's into you. You realize the love affair that you have with Jesus Christ, or can I say to you, the love affair that Jesus Christ has with you? We all want to be loved. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. You want to be loved, you're missing it. You're looking outside you when you ought to be looking inside you because the greatest love you will ever find is the love that God has for you in Christ who lives in you. You whine because you don't get the love you want from outside when you've got more than you could ever handle on the inside already. Why are you whining about what you don't have when you're not taking advantage of everything you do have? I don't understand that. Nobody else in your life has climbed on a cross and died for all of your sins, all of your family sins, all of your workers' sin. Everybody sins. Nobody's, nobody's ever cared for me like Jesus. Nobody. Nobody's ever cared for me like Jesus. Why do you sit around and whine all the time? It's impossible for you to be alone. It's impossible for you not to feel loved. It's impossible for you not to have peace. It's not possible. It's not possible. It is not possible because you're outside, not inside. Get inside with Christ. And then you'll see, you'll see the heavens open. And you'll see the essence of God flow through Christ in your life and manifest itself in you. 
you will see the power of the sovereignty of God. You will see the power of the love of God. You will see it. It won't be out here somewhere where I can't touch or feel. It'll be inside that manifests itself like a bomb dropping. It, the bomb drops and goes boom. That's called love. How is it possible that you don't have that security? How is it possible that you're not having those experiences? How is it possible that you're not seeing greater things than this? I live for this in my life. This is what I live for. I don't expect my wife to meet the needs that only God can meet. I don't expect my children to meet the needs that only God can meet. I don't expect my church to meet the needs that only God can meet. I don't expect the government to meet my needs that only God can meet. I don't expect anybody to do that. And I don't want anybody to do it because I want it to flow from the throne of God's heart through my life so that I can witness it. That's the experience of grace. When that happens, that's the experience of grace in your life. You got two circles on your paper with a cross. You got the cross and the line that goes down, the resurrection. That's death, burial, and resurrection. On the left, when you're looking at your paper on the left, that's Adam. Write the word Adam in there. And underneath Adam, write all die. In Adam, all die. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, in Adam, all die. Over, over on the other side of the cross, put the word Christ. Because in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, there's another circle. That's Christ. And it says, in Christ, all are made alive. Everybody's born in Adam, dead. Dead to God. Dead to Christ. Dead to spiritual side. They don't understand greater things than these you will experience. They ain't got a clue. That's the way they're born. And listen, that's Adam. Over on that circle, write the word world. Because if you're an Adam and not in Christ, then you're an Adam and the world. You're an Adam and the world. The world system, the God of this world, 1 John 5, 19, the God of this world, Satan, is running your life. Over on the other side is Jesus Christ. It's Christ who has made you alive. And over here on this side is the kingdom of God. It's called the kingdom of the beloved son. That's a divine viewpoint system. Over on, the, over on the Adam side and the world side is a cosmos diabolicus. It's a worldly system of evil. Evil based on what God calls evil, not on what man calls it. But if you're in Christ, you're under a different system of operation. You're not under the world system. You're under the kingdom of God system. You're under divine viewpoint system, not cosmos diabolicus. And it's important for you to understand what side you get your blessings from. You don't get them from over here. You get them from over here. Now, the only way you get from Adam to Christ is Colossians 1. Write this down. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. Here's what Colossians 1, 13 and 14 says. And listen closely. For he delivers us from the domain of darkness. That's in Adam in the world. That's called the domain of darkness. Jesus Christ came, died on a cross, was buried and raised from the dead. Watch this now. The key word in verse 13 is to rescue or deliver you or to save you. He is the only one that has the power to reach into the, into the death of Adam, reach into the darkness of the world, of that whole system, and pull you out of there. He is the only one. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the mediator between God and man. There's no other way. And his job is to reach down and rescue you. 
from the domain of darkness. And he's the only power in this whole world can do it. And he does it, not you. I'm saved by grace through faith and not of myself as a gift of God. My rescue is a gift. And he's the only one that has the power to reach down there. And his power comes from the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. If he doesn't go to the cross, that rescue will never happen. If he doesn't come out of the grave, that rescue will never happen. But since he went to the cross, was buried and raised from the dead, he has the power now over the devil and all his power system. He can reach in there and pull you out. When you believe that Jesus came into this world, died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, when you believe it, Jesus Christ, the power of the gospel is to, re because of the work of Christ, is to, is to rescue you from the domain of darkness. Now watch the second thing. Watch the second. And, and transfer us, and transfer us into the kingdom of his beloved son because we've been redeemed. Because of redemption. We call that redemption. When you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel is the power of God. Because of the work of Christ, he is able to rescue you and, it, and rescue you out of and transfer you into Christ where you are sealed forever. Who are? You think we don't have a message to tell the world? You don't think we have a good, good news message? You don't have to buy your way out. You can't beg your way out. There's no way out of where you're at except through the grace of God, through the work of Christ on the cross, raised from the dead. Now the power is to rescue you and the power to transfer you into Christ where you're made alive. And listen, there's your identity. Your identity in life is in Christ. Look, in that little pamphlet, 50 things, there's a section called the stat 20 status privileges. He's a son, I'm a son. Right? He's a child of promise, I'm a child of promise. He, he's the son of light, I'm a son of light. He's the chosen of God, I'm the chosen in him. He's eternal life, I'm eternal life. He's an heir, I'm an heir. His inheritance is mine. All this by grace now. All of this by grace. All of that. He's the beloved, I'm the beloved. He's a priest, I'm a priest. He's eternal life, I'm eternal life. I mean, the list goes on, 20 things. That's who you are. And it is because of that, you are now capable of seeing greater things in this life than you could have ever imagined in Adam. In Christ, these are all, all doors that open up to you the magnificence of the plan of God in your life. You know, you go to your family reunion and everybody's out in the Thule's. They sit in darkness and you walk in a room and light it up. Make sure you don't let them take your light out. You're not, you are not who the world says you are. You're not who your parents say you are. You're not what your resume says you are. You need to know who you are in Christ. And let God manifest who you are in Christ. Because all of these things are connected to the essence of God flowing to your life in specific ways. Just like you're a mother, a sister, a brother, a father, a whatever. you got to have identity to be able to push that. You understand what I mean? All of these are identities with Christ. And out of that comes enormous the enormous essence of God that runs this whole system. And you need to be able to see the manifestation of it. The manifest. I know you know the S and box S. I know the three O's, the I and the V. Oh, yeah, I know all that. I, I, I know. That's not what I'm talking about here today. I know you know that. I'm talking about knowing it here where you actually see the manifestation of it.
And pay attention to the identity you have when it's done. I'm an ambassador for Christ. Pay attention to how he uses ambassador to flow the essence of God into the, your midst, into other people. Boom. That's what I'm talking about. Hopefully two or three of you could get it. I'd be happy with that. Jesus seemed to be happy with one guy getting it. So what, what, what could I say? If one person gets it, I could be as happy. You see, Nathan began with doubt regarding the spiritual identity of Christ, and he walked away with it. <laughs> he, doubted, he, he doubted who Jesus was and walked away knowing who he was and identifying himself with it. Do you know after the book of John, we never hear of Nathaniel again? Now go find him again. He's never mentioned again. Je Listen, John is the only one that ever calls this disciple by the name of Nathaniel. Many believe he's Bartholomew. He certainly was one of the he was one of the first six disciples that followed Christ. That's kind of interesting too. The Renaissance of the New Testament on page 342 wrote this little piece on this whole concept. They said, Lord, give me doubt enough to keep me searching and faith enough to recognize the truth when I see it. That was kind of Nathaniel. They said, I think that's kind of Nathaniel. He had doubt. And then once he got it, he had it forever. That was me. I had all kinds of questions, had all kinds of doubt about who this man Jesus Christ is. Who is he possible? I thought he was a swear word. Who is this guy? I don't even give it a second thought today. I know who he is. I, I place my whole identity in him. Think about that. that that's, in my mind, Nathaniel. In this encounter with Jesus, Nathaniel saw the omniscience of God in Jesus because of the statement, I saw you under the fig tree. Nathan responded, wow, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. Jesus said, let's, let's, let's revisit that a moment, Nathaniel. I said, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? That's an eye question, isn't it? That's when you say that and you look right in a person's eye. You look right in their eye when you say, do you because He didn't wait for an answer. He looked right into his eye and got it. And then he said, you'll see greater things than these. Nathaniel told, Jesus told Nathaniel that he would see more of divine essence in the reality of his life. Like a bomb going off inside you, boom. Jesus showed Nathaniel another divine essence when he said, truly, truly, I say to you, the heavens will open and the angels will ascend because what he showed him now was the story of Jacob's ladder. That Jacob's ladder was a mediator between God and heaven and that mediator was Jesus Christ. That ladder was Jesus Christ. That ladder was Jesus Christ. Jesus brought Nathanael to God by showing him that Jesus Christ as the son of man was the mediator of Jacob's ladder. I suppose, I don't know, but I'm supposing that maybe the story of Jacob's ladder was one of Nathanael's favorite Bible stories because he sure had an opportunity to give a lot of examples, right? But somehow or another, he reached back into his childhood and pulled out a story and identified what it was about, something that he always wondered about. I imagine Nathaniel always wondered about the story. I wonder what that ladder was like. And here's the answer to it. You're looking at it. <laughs> You're looking at the ladder, Bubba. You're looking at it. 
Jesus gave Nathanael a new spiritual and doctrinal identity and view of Jacob's ladder. That is Jesus Christ. You need to read Matthew 4.11 because he said, you're, listen, you're going to see more of divine essence of God. You're going to see angels descending and ascending on the Son of Man. You're going to see that in Matthew 4. You're going to see that in Matthew 26, 53. You're going to see it in Hebrews 1, 14. And what is he talking about? He's talking about being able to see the, uh, the hypostatic union of, of Christ. Jesus is and always has been the mediator between God and mankind. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Galatians 3, 8. 16 through 20. Hebrews 12, 24, and a closing with 1 Timothy 2, 5. There is one God, one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, and people, that is it. And that's what Nathaniel got. And listen, what we need today is to understand that that mediatorship touches us with the throne of the essence of God, and we need to understand our identity the essence of God flows through our identity in Christ. And you need to witness that in your life. This is not something you die to get. This is something you live by faith to get. And you need to have the eyes to see the love of God manifest itself in your life, to see the abundance of eternal life manifest. You need to see these things, the sovereignty of God's will. You need to see it manifest in your life. Let me tell you, great praise comes from that. Great stability in your life comes from that identity. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way by automobile and by internet. I pray that as they look at these passages, they will study them in detail and, and bring the realization that what we're talking about is the mediatorship between God and man, Jesus Christ. And what does that mean? It means a relationship with God through Christ. It means identity with Christ, everything he is, I am. And it means bringing that essence of God, like omniscience, down into the realm of understanding in the human realm of what we call the kingdom of the beloved son, where the dynamics of that works in a world of darkness and a, a, a world that's torn up by all kinds of false thinking, even about themselves. I pray, Father, we will find our identity. As we find our salvation, we will find our identity in that salvation in Jesus Christ. In his name we've prayed.